Well, happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Chronicles Magazine podcast. I'm happy to be joined today by William Watkins Jr., who has written a piece over at Chronicles Magazine in their Remembering the Right series. This one is Remembering John Taylor of Caroline. So thank you, Bill, for, for joining me. No, CJ, thank you for having me on the podcast. I love it. I'm a regular listener. Great. And we're uh, producing these regularly now, so I'm excited to have more of this uh, in the coming year. But John Taylor, um, I think he's a fascinating character. He's probably um, not known as well as he should be. And so, of course, I appreciate you bringing him out uh, into our context and, and talking to me about him today. But uh, before we get started in that, what's your own like intellectual background? You know, what, what draws you into these things? Well, you know, I started sort of my intellectual journey uh, as a libertarian back in the late 80s, early 90s. And then I got introduced uh, to some of the paleoconservative thought. And, you know, of course, back then there was a nice uh, sort of a John Randolph Club uh, grouping of conservatives and libertarians. And through some of the friends I met there, I uh, got more interested in uh, some of the more conservative, traditional uh, thought. And I believe in with constitutionalism, I think uh, the paleo libertarians and uh, the conservatives have a lot in common anyway there. And just as my journey went on, I pushed more and more uh, toward the paleo conservative uh, side of things um, and uh, got to meet Tom Fleming, other folks with Chronicles uh, back in the day and started a fruitful relationship uh, talking about ideas and writing. Mm -hmm. We're talking today about um, John Taylor. So I mean, the relevance of him to your work uh, probably relates to the constitutional or the legal system side of things. So maybe a little bit, talk a little bit about your, your background in that area, and then we can transition into John Taylor. No, sure. I uh, The early republic is what interests me, and that's what my uh, first book was on back uh, in the early 2000s, 2002, 2004, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions uh, of Jefferson and Madison. Of course, the principles of 98, and when you dig into that, um, Taylor was a big force uh, even before Jefferson uh, really got uh, on board with uh, idea of state nullification and that something had to be done about the Alien and Sedition Acts. If you look at his correspondence, John Taylor was, as it were, in his ear uh, that something needed to be done about the situation between the states and national government. And originally, Jefferson uh, and some of the correspondents tried to talk him down a bit that, you know, we don't need to be thinking about secession or any major steps. Um, the union is vital. Um, but it was only a few months after that, that Jefferson, as he saw the Federalists from his seat as the vice president, uh, pushing through these measures uh, with the quasi-war with France and such that he adopted a more uh, Taylor-esque view of matters as we can see uh, in his draft of the Kentucky resolution is call for nullification in that. So there's no doubt Taylor had great influence on uh, Mr. Jefferson as he was deciding how he would handle this crisis as the leader of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So John Taylor was born in the mid 18th century, so before the revolution. And so he was a young man during it. Is that is that accurate? That's right. He uh, started his law practice uh, in 1774 uh, mm -hmm. after studying with Edmund Pendleton. And obviously that got interrupted with service. Uh, he served, of course, in the uh, Continental Army. He served in Virginia uh, militia. Uh, he served honorably, and of course, out of the latter, he left as a lieutenant colonel, which is why in many writings, people will refer to him as Colonel Taylor from his mm -hmm. uh, uh, highest rank he achieved uh, during the war. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you talk about the crisis that he had to deal with, intellectually deal with, and Jefferson in, was involved. What was that crisis and, and sort of, you know, set the context for, for us on that? Well, you know, Taylor, of course, was not involved really in the struggle over ratification of the Constitution. He was too busy practicing law. Um, okay. 
and he used his law practice to earn good money to buy land because uh, that's where he saw value. And we perhaps will talk later about uh, his scientific farming techniques. He was really sort of what I call the Joel Salatin uh, <laughs> day as uh, innovative agricultural techniques, how to take care of the land. But anyway, he was focused on his practice and farming until finally, uh, after ratification of the Constitution uh, and knowing he was a solid Republican, uh, Virginians uh, asked him to serve in the Senate, which he did for a short stint. And really, I think his political future is molded there as he gets not just a newspaper account of the differing views of the Federalists and Jeffersonian Republicans, but gets up close and personal and even has a is approached uh, by a couple of um, New England senators, Rufus King being one, uh, wanting to discuss dissolution of the Union, um, essentially recognizing that uh, the New England states needed a close relationship with Great Britain. Uh, they were com a commercial entity. Uh, whereas the southern states were exporters of commodities, depended more on free trade, and this whole marriage, the New Englanders, the New Englanders thought, was not going to work out. And though nothing comes of these talks, uh, early on, though, Taylor, I think, sees what he would call the true colors uh, of the New England uh, capitalists, that they look uh, to their own interest rather than that of the whole, and mm -hmm. that um, gave him pause. And then as we go forward in the 1790s, we really have just a whole crucible of discord there. You have the Bank of the United States and um, the questions of its constitutionality. You have, of course, the French Revolution uh, and how that split the Republicans uh, as well as the Federalist Republicans being more pro-French, at least early on. Uh, until the horrors of the revolution uh, were shown. The Federalists always staunchly anti-French as they uh, always wanted to cultivate a close relationship with Great Britain, even if that meant uh, looking the other way with impressment of American sailors and things like that. Uh, so you, we move forward with these uh, events and these two parties just having a really a different view for America, uh, one, of course, pro-British, commercial, a uh, loose construction of the Constitution meant to uh, energize or aggrandize the new uh, national government, and the other, uh, the Republicans, being more pro-French, a uh, strict interpretation of the Constitution and agriculture as their priorities. Mm -hmm. And so you have these views really colliding in the early Republic. And then sort of the grenade goes off with the alien and sedition laws in 1798. Which Again, is under, that's under John Adams. That's absolutely right. Adams was president. Uh, he and Jefferson had had a close election uh, after Washington decided to resign uh, after two terms. And um, many think that Washington kept it close to the vest for a while um, at the behest of the Federalists to prevent the Republicans from campaigning too quickly or too strong. Um, but anyway, Adams uh, wins the election. Jefferson becomes his vice president. Not a marriage made in heaven, uh, for sure, because at this time, you know, in the Constitution, you could not uh, the electors could not designate candidates for president and vice president. It was whoever the majority vote getter becomes president, the runner up vice president, even if they were not of the same party or same inclination. Mm -hmm. So you have Jefferson and Madison uh, or Jefferson and Adams in that situation. And um, then Jefferson's vice president, and he's watching with horror as the Federalists, again, wanting to go to war with France and believing French armies are about to invade the United States, uh, which was you know, just hoopla, uh, not about to happen, though there were uh, uh, incidents on the high seas between American and French ships. Again, the quasi-war, as it's called. 
Uh, but with that, uh, the Federalists essentially make it a crime with the Sedition Act to criticize the national government. Um, they give the president almost uh, complete power over alien friends, uh, any alien that he deemed dangerous to the United States based on his suspicion uh, alone, without a judicial proceeding, he could order deported uh, uh, or arrest. Um, and if they left, if he ordered an alien to leave the country, he came back in, uh, Adams could have him thrown in prison for as long as the public safety required. Uh, so, you know, broad powers in the executive and Jefferson uh, and other Republicans, of course, are seeing this. And Jefferson, um, as vice president, gets a close up view of what's going on. And uh, you have this whole issue of construction of the Constitution that we mentioned earlier with the bank. But here it comes in uh, nicely with the First Amendment. Right. Congress shall make no law. It begins. And so we have a federal law that you can't criticize the national government. Uh, or the president, uh, what sort of construction have we here? And we see these broad theories of interpretation about the general welfare clause, the preamble, uh, war powers and inherent authority. Um, well, what so I mean, what you're building up to, it seems to me, as a lot of the progressive interpretations of the Constitution that in the 20th century have obviously led to the managerial state and the abuse of power, they could find a lot of their source way back in the beginning. No, that's right. This is uh, early on. We see these fights over interpretation uh, in the very early 1790s going up to the later 1790s. And, uh, you know, Taylor, of course, was concerned about uh, these theories of construction, uh, was advising Jefferson uh, that we have to do something uh, or the states are really going to be left adrift with no mechanism of defense against a consolidated national government. Uh, again, Taylor was in his ear, as it were, before Madison and Jefferson finally decide they needed to do something with the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. And of course, we see Jefferson's statements on nullification and the compact theory. Uh, but Taylor was uh, ahead of him on that, urging uh, mm -hmm. measures there. Um, you know, of course, fortunately, uh, that matter was resolved at the ballot box and Jefferson uh, becomes the president. And uh, Adams and the Federalists are tossed out of office, but um, you know the danger was not over. Uh, to quote a piece that Edmund Pendleton wrote, just because we have a change of parties, a change of men, doesn't mean everything's okay. Right, which of course is still a relevant critique of today. Let, let, so let me ask you this then. Um, Taylor was making these arguments before the Constitution was even ratified. Um, you know, what were the dynamics that he saw as threatening to the rights of Virginia, particularly that that may have inspired him to become one of the you know predominant anti-federalists? Right. Well, let's we have to remember, let's go to first principles. Uh, you ask many Americans, why did we fight the revolution? What was that all about? We get stories that it was a tax protest. Uh, we were greatly oppressed by Great Britain, this, that, and the other. But the bottom line is it was over self-government. It was over uh, who shall make laws for local communities. Uh, the 13 states viewed themselves as 13 pre-existing political communities. And essentially, uh, the fight, the issue behind the revolution was would a foreign government, parliament, distant and centralized, make the laws for the several states, or would they make their own laws in their own legislatures or many parliaments? Uh, Self-government was the principle uh, of the revolution, and that was essentially the North Star for Taylor. He grew up hearing these debates, uh, discuss these matters as a continental soldier, knew what he was fighting for, uh, that was the principles of self-government and realized that that idea of self-government 
was best uh, evinced in the Articles of Confederation, though there were, of course, uh, problems with the Articles. Uh, Taylor and all the Anti-Federalists agreed with that, um, but were they great enough problems that we should um, go over to an entirely new system? Taylor, obviously, and the Anti-Federalists uh, didn't think so, but they lost the day on that. Right. It's when when you look at the um the anti federalist you know one of the things that the federalists mm -hmm. observed you know during that time is that there was a certain spirit in the south you know among the southern states that were attracted to some of the more radical aspects of the french revolution but john taylor um not john yeah john taylor he he wasn't part of that world there's i mean the south is, has a lot of variety to it and he had more of a conservative demeanor that that wasn't making these arguments against federalism on the basis of radicalism, but rather on the basis of his own Southern heritage and the local idea of uh, self-government. No, you're absolutely right. He, it was based essentially on his Revolutionary War experience and how he correctly interpreted the American Revolution, uh, realizing that the key point for him was that though he hated to use the word sovereignty. He said sovereignty uh, is a term that belongs to the divine, not governments or politics, but we're sort of stuck with that term. Uh, but ultimate authority or ultimate sovereignty, Taylor argued as a result of the American Revolution was transferred from an artificial body, that is parliament under the British system, uh, as a result of the Glorious Revolution, Parliament could make or unmake any laws it saw fit, including the British Constitution itself. Mm -hmm. um, that ultimate power via the American Revolution was transferred to the people, but not just any people, the people of the several states, again, being pre-existing political communities. Uh, that is where sovereignty lay. And again, that was key for Taylor understanding the constitutional issues of the day. Uh, his favoritism for a system of the articles is in these states, the people could better uh, exercise this ultimate authority. And when they delegate power, uh, it's much easier to mind the officials in your state government uh, who you've delegated power to than in, say, a more centralized government where they're far away from you and, um, you know, they're not, you don't see them regularly and uh, they're in their own little world of uh, a, a nation's capital. Right. And so he does represent a lot of the concerns of the Virginians. I know Patrick Henry uh, was not enthusiastic at all about the constitutional developments. Um, nevertheless, though, the Constitution was ratified, and John Taylor had a different interpretation of its uh, the, the parameters that it gave to the federal government than did um, you know those in power after after it was ratified. So maybe talk a little bit about that. He wasn't fond of the of the Constitution, and yet uh, he recognized that it was actually still a more limiting document than others were willing to abuse it for. No, that's right. Taylor was what we might call an originalist meaning we should interpret the Constitution um, by the promises that were made by the friends of the Constitution, right. otherwise known as the Federalists, uh, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, and uh, you know the others in the state ratifying conventions uh, who over and over promised, look, this is a government of few and defined powers. The states retain numerous and indefinite powers. The national government's powers will essentially function in the realm of foreign commerce, diplomacy, war, uh, Indian relations, uh, these large matters uh, that are of continental concern and are just a handful of things. And Taylor, and his view wanted to hold them to their promises. This is how you sold the Constitution uh, to the people and their ratifying conventions. Let's consistently interpret it uh, as the document that you sold to us. Right. And so um, the Alien and Sedition Acts sort of initiated a crisis. Um, 
and was that the was there more to it than that? I mean, when, so my question is, when did nullification come along? Was that was that for Taylor an immediate thing, or did that come along later because there actually was something that needed to be dealt with politically? Well, I think you could actually trace nullification back to the American Revolution. For example, you look at Jefferson's uh, summary view of the rights of British North America, where he declares multiple acts of parliament void and of no force. Uh, so this idea of nullification has seeds going way back in American history. But, you know, certainly Taylor, uh, even before Jefferson wanted to fully embrace um the ideas of nullification. Uh, Taylor was at the forefront there uh, with him, urging uh, him that this is really a revolutionary moment. Uh, and Jefferson, until the Alien Sedition Acts, did not appreciate fully what Taylor was saying. And he comes to understand that, for example, in his draft of the uh, Kentucky resolution where he uh, asked that committees of conference and correspondence be set up among the states. Uh, why is that important? Well, that's uh, what the states did in the American Revolution. Um, that was a revolutionary measure for them to communicate and govern and coordinate. Uh, so just the use of those terms show where Jefferson's mind finally went that we are a uh, on the cusp of a revolutionary event, something that Taylor saw, uh, you know, years earlier uh, from his vantage point, again, early on in the Senate and then in the Virginia House of Delegates um, and then just monitoring affairs from Hazelwood, his plantation. What does the spirit of 98 mean? The spirit of 98, the principles of 98 uh, would be those good old fashioned Republican principles that triumphed over the Federalists uh, in the election of 1800, but are uh, given to us in written form in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions that Jefferson and Madison wrote, as well as Madison's great document, uh, uh, his report to the Virginia Assembly. Uh, defending the resolutions against attacks by other states. I mean, essentially the compact theory uh, that the United States uh, Constitution is a compact uh, where the several states are the parties to it, uh, that the parties to the compact have the ultimate right to interpret or deal with infractions of the Constitution, that no branch of the national government, because no branch is a party to the compact, uh, can interpret uh, the Constitution for everyone else, whether it be uh, one of the three branches of the national government or even the state governments. And that is a principle that Taylor clung to doggedly and continued uh, to advance. Uh, you know, for example, in uh, you mentioned Tyranny Unmasked, uh, one of his uh, great books there. Uh, Taylor's a huge advocate of this idea of state veto, whether we want to call it nullification or not, uh, that the Supreme Court cannot be the final interpreter uh, of what Taylor describes as the political or fundamental uh, values of the Constitution or rules. Um, that were set by the people. Yes, it can adjudicate cases between individuals relating to law and how a law is applied. Uh, but as, again, not a party to the compact, just one branch of the national government, um, the, the states, on the other hand, would have the inherent authority of veto a right to self-defense based on, again, ultimate sovereignty, the construction of the Constitution, uh, to do so. So this idea of nullification or state veto, yep, it, we can trace it early to the American Revolution, but it's also though a principle associated with obviously Mr. Jefferson and the Kentucky Resolution and later Calhoun. Uh, John Taylor was right there uh, before Calhoun ever came around uh, arguing for a state veto, uh, pushing the principles of 98 um, 
Of course, many of the tertium quids, the old Republicans, once Jefferson got in power, uh, accused him of um, backtracking on some of his principles on uh, mm-hmm. the principles of 98. Uh, but Taylor could you could never subject him to that uh, accusation. He remained consistent throughout his career. What you're describing here is what you've called in your article the a, a suggested structural change in the Constitution. But do you think this suggested structural change was actually, for in Taylor's mind, implied already in the constitutional dynamic? No, I think it was already implied, though, to make it explicit and give it more power. You know, he urged Jefferson before the Kentucky resolution was drafted that, you know, we need uh, the Constitution to be amended so the states will have some clear right to interpret this for themselves uh, before their powers are trampled and they're left. Like we have today administrative subdivisions of the national government. So I think Mm -hmm. Taylor would have preferred uh, an express constitutional provision uh, making that clear just because that's a more powerful sword to wield. But uh, he would not hesitate from arguing that the very structure, the nature of ultimate sovereignty, the structure of the constitution, uh, the natural right of self-defense all counsel for that as well. And so this, so, so he was at the time he was a, was he a congressman or a senator when he was engaging in this? Well, you know, he, unlike many of um, some of our Republican heroes, you know, Taylor did not spend that much time in office. Again, the Virginia, he was appointed by Virginia, the federal Senate uh, in the early 1790s to finish a short term. Then he went to the Virginia house of delegates where of course, Um, During this time with the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, uh, he introduced Mr. Madison's Virginia resolution into the House of Delegates. Then we see him for a short term again in the Senate uh, in Jefferson's first administration. And then he doesn't really hold office uh, again until we approach uh, the 1820s. Uh, He was spent his time. Uh, running his plantation, farming, and of course, writing some great books on constitutional interpretation. Yeah, I mean, he he sort of exemplifies the uh, the civil scholar that um, that's such such a southern um, you know such a southern thing. You know, he like so many of those southerners were like layman scholars. Uh, you know, it's pretty fascinating to see that culture uh, at work in the early Republican dynamics. I, I want to move to a little bit to. Um, the the concept of the people in the constitution we have this idea you know this phrase we the people and the federal government always invokes this phrase um, to suppress states rights uh, rather than to uphold it what would you say john taylor's conception of the people would be and how does it compare to the way you know uh you know centralization centralizers would use it no oh, that's a great question for example um Modern constitutional scholars like Yale's Akhil Lamar argue that the Constitution was the greatest corporate merger ever, that you took uh, 13 distinct peoples and merged them into one united people, one mass entity known as the American people. Uh, You know, James Wilson, some other Federalists made similar arguments back in the day. Uh, Taylor took that on uh, head first uh, and indicated that had anyone ever communicated such a principle to the American people in their several states that they would be dissolving their individuality uh, in different states and become this one homogenized mass, the Constitution would never have been ratified and everybody knew that. Um, and Taylor saw this source of when you talk about, again, we often loosely say, well, the people are sovereign, the people, uh, Taylor would say, be specific. What people, right. there's no such thing as the American people. It's right. the people of South Carolina, the people of California or of Massachusetts. And if you think about it today, CJ, uh, I often, I teach a, constitutional law class at Wofford College. 
And uh, I often ask my students when we talk about the American people, say, tell me one act of constitutional significance that the American people can do outside their states. And you can't think of any because we elect members of the uh, lower house of Congress and districts within the states, even with the 17th Amendment now. Uh, of course, the states used to select their own senators, but we still elect them uh, within the states. Uh, presidential electors, the Electoral College, uh, there's no national popular vote. The president is chosen by electors from within the individual states. Uh, there's not one thing this American people can do. Uh, and Taylor recognized that and focused on the people of the individual states as the ultimate sovereigns. Do you think that there's a, um, a line that can be drawn between the progressive movement at the early 20th century and um, some of the, you know, the mentality of the Federalists at the beginning? No, I think you definitely can draw a line. Now, it would be correct uh, to point out that, you know, the Federalists in many instances were the conservatives of the time. Um, and some of uh, the more progressive notions about democracy and other things would have uh, shocked and frightened them. However, but when it comes to the use of government power for what uh, a party or a faction might determine as good and legitimate ends, uh, the Federalists are definitely uh, right there with the progressives, whether it be the Bank of the United States, tariffs, a pension roll, uh, what have you, uh, you know, bounties to manufacturers and industry. Um, you can draw a line to the progressives uh, that, of course, the Democratic Party co-opted uh, most of them into the party. Um, of a large national government, uh, public assistance programs, uh, war socialism and World War I, and then uh, to the New Deal, uh, strong government action there. There's definitely uh, a correlation there. Mm -hmm. Sort of, um, it kind of reared its ugly head, but far beyond what the Federalists themselves would have uh, ever imagined or been comfortable with. No, even Alexander Hamilton uh, would be shocked uh, at some of the interpretations and uses of power that we have today, especially with re, uh, redistributing wealth. Uh, you know, the, the Federalists would have been aghast uh, mm -hmm. at much of that. Uh, though, you know, certainly they had their bounties for their favored few uh, in the commercial classes and manufacturing classes, but mm -hmm on the scope that we have and these large scale redistribution programs. Uh, no, they, they would have been aghast. Mm -hmm. Would people have, like, like John Taylor, um, would they, would he have been satisfied at all by the, the olive branch that the bill of rights uh, was meant to be? No, uh, n no real anti-federalist could have been satisfied with the bill of rights. You know, it, we, think of the Bill of Rights as a great national treasure, at least that's the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, it fell so short from what it was supposed to be, what was to be demanded. Um, you know, the, the Anti-Federalists, the um, state ratification conventions demanded and were promised structural changes in the Constitution, in addition uh, to securing, obviously, you know, rights of conscience and other things like that against the national government. But Madison uh, and other Federalists, uh, once they got the Constitution ratified without uh, a prior convention or prior amendments, um, though they had to make good on doing something, uh, to be honest, they did as little as possible enough where they could say, you know, we've kept our word. Here are 12 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, but, you know, Madison himself said that he would not really consider a structural amendment, say, on the taxing power or, uh, uh, you know, things like that, that this was 
um, really a, a smoke screen, to be honest with you, is what the Bill of Rights was. So, you know, no, and even Hamilton himself, uh, Governor Morris, you know, commented that uh, the Bill of Rights, if you were opposed to the Constitution beforehand, uh, this wasn't going to uh, make you fall in love with it. It wasn't much. Mm -hmm. I want to get to a couple of questions um, that some of people have been putting into my my comments here. The first one is, um, can you comment a little bit about John Taylor's uh, economic um, instincts? Maybe it's a good word there. Would he agree more with Jefferson in this um, agrarian uh, mentality? Now, he was certainly, uh, again, a great agrarian statesman, uh, wrote much on farming. Uh, now, you know, Taylor, we see in some of his writings that he um, wails against the capitalists, but we have to be careful with terms. This is pre-Marxian times. Um, he's simply referring to capitalists in the same way Adam Smith did and his wealth of nations, and it was not in a positive sense. It was essentially individuals that were entirely concerned about profit without ever considering the good of their communities there. Right. Uh, that was what he meant by a capitalist. Obviously, Taylor earned good livings from capitalism with his farm, uh, with his plantations, and he did not begrudge those involved in industry or manufacturing from doing the same. However, he thought we had a duty to consider our communities and our fellow citizens and how we go about business. You could think, you know, example today is if an American factory owner realizes that he can move his factory to Mexico or China and therefore save money and claim that he can sell us t-shirts cheaper now and we're better off for it, uh, he would be in that sense a capitalist as Adam Smith or Taylor would use the word. And so far as he has not thought about, well, what about the you know 2,000 people that needed a living wage and this factory was their home and their town was built up around it. Uh, have you even considered the community? What what are they going to do now for a living? Um, and you know, Taylor believed we had a duty to consider our fellows uh, in that regard rather than just the bottom line. So he was um, he spent a lot of time um, fighting against what he considered to be mercantilist interests in the North, the, the interests of the uh, industrial capitalists. Um, so talk a little bit about like the dynamic between those federal, you know, northern industrialists and the southern agrarians. I'm sure. Again, it much comes back to the tariff controversy as well. Um, and we see this again. This is long before Calhoun um, ever uh, really picks up on the issue. As you know, we know early in his career, Calhoun was much of a nationalist, along with Henry Clay and the other war hawks uh, coming out of the War of 1812. But we have early on Taylor inveighing against the tariff. Uh, again, arguing, you know, factory owners in the North, uh, I wish you no ill. Hope you make a lot of money there. But why should we in the South bear the brunt of this tax, the tariff, as we export goods and by necessity import uh, imported goods based on what we have uh, sold products for and are dependent upon that? And we have to pay this tax to keep you propped up. Uh, essentially, we have become your tax slaves there. Mm -hmm. um, we should be co-equal, independent states, independent citizens, uh, and not uh, leeching off one another. Uh, so Taylor sees this early on uh, with the protective tariff and uh, other parts of the northern uh, mercantile system and uh, invades strongly against it. Would Taylor have been surprised at the coming of the Civil War? No, not at all. Um, he, like Jefferson, uh, he heard the fire bell in the night when the Missouri uh, question was raised. And you know, the first uh, thing Taylor said and realized is, uh, you know, gentlemen, we this whole issue of slavery was settled 
put to bed by the compromises of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, to resurrect this is going to be national suicide. Uh, it's reckless to do so. Uh, we should adhere uh, to the wisdom of the framers, uh, recognize uh, the deals that were struck, uh, and stick to that rather than divide ourselves um, sectionally. And of course, Taylor realized they were all, you know, long before Missouri, he recognized that uh, North and South had uh, different interests and were somewhat at odds on many things. But this whole division of power uh, and uh, drawing a line across the continent, uh, he saw no good to come from it, uh, especially with the slavery issue. And uh, yeah, he saw trouble coming and on the horizon. Is there any indication in his writings that he was... Um optimistic or pessimistic about the integrity of the union? No, I think with, especially with Missouri, his pessimism uh, grew. You, you would be pessimistic even without Missouri. Uh, when you look at, again, the Bank of the United States, uh, how it was resurrected by James Madison, uh, the push for internal improvements, uh, uh, by the Northerners, again, wanting canals and other things uh, to boost their productivity, um, make it easier to get their goods to market, but they were for local interests, not national interests. Uh, Taylor saw this already. Uh, he also, you know, he recognized that uh, with this, again, small scale compared to what we have today, transfer of wealth, um, in Tyranny Unmasked, he tells us that uh, tyranny arrives and approaches upon us uh, when we get the patron status of government versus the people uh, mixed up. Uh, we all know government doesn't produce anything of value. Uh, the people pay for government services such as, uh, say, uh, an army, uh, however small it might need to be uh, to protect the country, Navy, etc., from taxes. But when it's flip-flop, the people aren't the patrons of the government, but government becomes the patron of the people by redistributing wealth and benefits and such, which was happening via internal improvements, tariffs, pensions, uh, etc. Taylor was very pessimistic. He described that as tyranny. Uh, and it was uh, fast gaining on America. So he, he wouldn't have been OK with Congress here voting itself raises? <laughs> no, he would not have been. He, you know, Taylor had a he viewed um, sort of this energetic government party and to use terms of British political discourse as a court party, essentially dependent on corruption uh, to make its living and push its agenda forward. Uh, where he saw himself and the Jeffersonian opposition as a court, I mean, as a country party, uh, looking to defeat corruption, to push the monarchy uh, back, to give power to the people. Mm -hmm. I have two more questions for you. One is from me and one is from an audience member. Uh, so my question is, why is John Taylor relevant today in 2024? Well, if we're going to survive, uh, we have an empire, obviously. I mean, we have kept the form of a republic, um, but we essentially live in an empire. And in the American empire, if we are not going to kill one another, be at each other's throats constantly over issues, uh, there is only one answer. And that is federalism, as pointed to by John Taylor, uh, Thomas Jefferson and others, Taylor probably being more Jeffersonian than Jefferson, as mm -hmm. some would say, uh, that that's the only way we're going to live together in peace is if we can accept a government of few and defined powers in the nation, uh, limited to a few objects. And if your neighbors in California want to have abortion on demand and what's left of uh, Protestant Christianity in South Carolina wants a heartbeat bill 
or some other restrictions, that we agree to disagree, that what you do in California is no more relevant to me than what they're doing in Finland. Um, and the same uh, for Californians, that they shouldn't lose sleep at night uh, because of whatever uh, internal laws we have in South Carolina. Uh, otherwise, if when we make every issue a national issue, uh, we're going to be at each other's throats. And um, yes, there's a lot of rhetoric and hyperbole, hyperbole about you know possibility of a, another American Civil War. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I do know this: uh, that our home, that is this union, uh, is not real happy right now. Uh, and there's a lot of strife. There's a lot of stridency. And Taylor has the answer. Uh, federalism, real federalism, not devolving a few powers here and there, but a real federal republic. Um, that's how we can live together and we can push forward. Without that, I don't think we should have much hope. I always I think of the uh, what happened a month ago in Texas, you know, just indications of, of the need for nullification and, and pushback at the state level. And those signs are healthy and they can find so many good legal and constitutional resources in the work of John Taylor. So my last question, you know, pivoting off of that is, um, you know, besides the book that we mentioned, uh, Tyranny Unmasked, what other books by John Taylor would you recommend, perhaps letters or speeches or maybe some biographies if people want to learn more about his thinking? No, I will tell you, Taylor is not easy to read. Uh, his prose is very dense. You need to be patient, but it's worth the slog to get through. Uh, uh, new Views of the Constitution, Tyranny Unmasked, uh, my favorite, Construction Construed and Constitutions Vindicated. Uh, I mean, what a you know, great book just on the nature of the union. Uh, constitutional interpretation, American first principles. Uh, you know, you can find these out there on Amazon. Uh, good biography, John Taylor, Pastoral Republican, very uh, readable biography. Do you, do you happen to recall who who wrote that? Um, if you, now that you ask me, it flies yeah, out. Of course, <laughs> I can look it up and put it in the show notes page. But um, at least you said the title, and Google should help you from there. But um, he's fascinating. People need to learn more about him. He's always relevant. Our history is always relevant. So thank you, Bill, for taking the time to do this. Hey, great to be here, CJ. Thank you for doing this podcast. You bet. Mm -hmm.